It is now about 100 years that the theory of relativity and the quantum physics, quantum mechanics, brought a real earthquake into the classic ways of science, especially the physics. But the topic of near-death experiences, it can bring even a bigger earthquake, and not only to the neuroscience. It can change our understanding of our life, because it can open a very big picture above our existence. In a way, it may perhaps become even a challenge for the modern time humanity to integrate the implication of this phenomena. We live in illusion and the appearance of things. There is a reality. You are that reality. When you understand this, you see that you are nothing. And being nothing, you are everything. And that's all. Tibetan Master Kalu Rinpoche You see, so the near-death experiences are not real in the way they appear to the dying people. Similarly, like this world around us is not real in the way we are perceiving it. And it is not only the Buddhist wisdom and Buddhist insight which, are, which is telling that, it is even our science which knows that as well. Giving example, the light and the colors, they don't exist. These are just the electromagnetic waves of a very particular wavelengths and the electromagnetic waves are colorless or even lightless, it is the interpretation of our eye and especially the brain which gives the appearance of light and colors and shapes and all that. But the Buddhist teachings are also very unequivocal about the other side of this truth, that in the different frequencies of existence, or if you like, in the different frequencies of appearances, the experience of happiness and sorrow is what it is. You know? Your toothache, hmm, it's good to know it is just appearance. Does it help you? I think I don't need to explain what is meant by near-death experiences because this topic is now discussed everywhere. You can find it even in the mainstream medias. You will find it in professional literature, in the magazines, uh, even in daily newspapers. Usually there is an attempt to explain it away in some way. But also, to be honest, there is also increasing number of articles popping up representing rather the other side of the discussion. So, in this talk I would explore the phenomenon of near-death experiences as objectively as I can, assuming a position from where I can cover or even explain all the confronting or conflicting argumentation of the different sides of the, of the discussion. And let's be clear that these involved sides of discussion have sometimes a substantial argumentation for their, 
for their position. Sometimes it is even enhanced by emotions. You know, because it is such a sensitive topic. The mainstream science, for example, will try to explain the whole near-death experiences purely materialistically as a result of the brain chemistry. All these neurotransmitters, endorphins, dopamine, serotonin, all, all that. And certainly they have a, quite a heavy waiting argumentation, for example, that you don't need to be dying to have this kind of experiences similar to near-death experiences. And it's true, another situation may lead to similar experiences. But actually in the science the predominant explanation is in this dying brain surge. Kind of a last goodbye of the dying brain, you know, putting out this final spectacular firework of brain chemistry. So that would be the position of mainstream science. But then we have another angle of argumentation and this comes from, from the side of psychology. Coming with the hypothesis that the near-death experience can be actually kind of recalling or reliving of the trauma of birth. You know, this tunnel and the white light and the spiritual unconditioned love so many times reported in the near-death experiences, comparing it with the birth channel the baby coming out to the daylight, being covered by the unconditioned love from the parents. Hmm. So that would be the argumentation from the psychology side. And then we have of course the religious community seeing in it rather the confirmation of the oldest religious idea, actually, that there is a continuation of existence after the body dies, this kind of afterlife, that only the soul is living the dying body and goes its way to the different destiny. Actually, Buddhism is not really working with the concept of soul, of eternal soul, but it has the idea of eternal rebirth, coming from a lifetime to the other one and again in different spheres of existence. That's the Buddhist point of view. It is clear that in, in my explanations I will use predominantly the wisdom and insight coming from the Buddhist teachings because it opens the biggest picture above all these phenomena of near-death experiences, of afterlife, even of this contemporary existence here and now, explaining so many things. So, in this talk, wanting to take this superposition, trying to incorporate all this kind of uh, argumentation into one clear explanation. It is a little bit like the three facets or three sides of this strange object. So the circle would represent, let's say, the psychology view. The square would represent the scientific way of explanation. And the cross would be the religious way of understanding. You know, like three facets of one object and our task would be rather to see the whole, the whole object in one glance. Not that one of these is correct and the other false. That is not very helpful. The truth is main contained in this kind of um, explanation which covers all the existing ones. Um, actually, I've done it already. If you have seen the video UFO and Buddhism, in the second half, 
beside many other things. I was also explaining this juxtaposition of Darwinism and creationism with this superposition, finding a kind of a position from where these two are fully integrated, not that one is right and the other is completely false, doesn't work so. The truth is more contained in this kind of uh, embracing all what we know. It is something like searching for common denominator. You, you may know it from mathematics. If you have, let's say, number 2, 3, 4, it is not 4 because the 3 is not properly contained in that. It is not the 6, 9, no, 12. You have to go up to the 12 because all these 3 are properly contained in that. So, for task of this magnitude, I will start with explanation, with a fundamental explanation of the relationship between brain and mind. Because this is the foundation. We have to start with that. So, I will explain it with the help of a computer. But, I ask you, Please be attentive to it, even if it may appear to you somehow primitive or boring or whatever. Stay attentive through this little exercise, because I will refer to it many times even later in this talk. So get it properly. Here it is. So as you can see, I have attached many of the peripheral devices to make the analogy to a living human being as complete as possible. Uh, the camera is really connected and that's the symbol of a human seeing and it works. Microphone is the hearing, symbol for the hearing ability. Uh, speaker is clear, that's the speaking. The modem connected to internet is the symbol for our social contacts, socializing. Keyboard and the mouse is the symbol for our active, for the active part of our life when we are doing things, executing things. The mouse symbol for decisions deciding every day many things. The little light in the back is the symbol for conceptual thinking, sometimes on, sometimes off. And the hard disk, the external hard drive, in this case worldly data, the worldly information stored in a memory. And now we have the mind. The notebook is the symbol symbolizing the human mind. And the screen, the consciousness. The experience of our life is happening actually on the screen of consciousness. And we see uh, already now uh, experience running. So I think the representation of a living human being is as complete as possible. But now, we have here two different switches. One button has the label OBE, which means out-of-body experience, and the other one, the red one, has the label death of the body. So, first, let us see what will happen when I press the OBE button. Let's do it. OK. The notebook is now undocked from the docking station. So the first thing you can see that the experience continues. If we look in detail to the docking station left behind, this is the representation of the human body with the sensory organs and the brain. And now you see that the mind actually is working 
even when it is undocked. Very important message uh, from that. Now, we can see that the notebook has its own camera, has its own microphones and the speaker and the keyboard and the touchpad and the hard disk with its own memory. And only it is now wireless. It has also antenna, so still con connections with other beings is possible. But the communication now is more or less telepathic. It doesn't use this normally the slow human language. The contacts with another beings are now much um, directer mind to mind. Now, this is the analogy for out-of-body experiences some people are reporting. But what I mean, out-of-body experiences really verified when the mind of the people really is witnessing something which can be later verified and really bringing testimony about things happening in another places. So that's a classic out-of-body experience. Now, if we look back in detail on the docking station symbolizing the human body with the sensory organs and the brain, all the material components of our body. It's still alive. Some lights little are on, but it is in a vegetative state. It is like vegetable. The mind and consciousness has gone. Only the basic function of the body, of the living body, are still direct, directed directly by brain, the heartbeat, the breathing. Now, for the purpose of this demonstration, I dared even to open the docking station to see inside. So that what I, what I am doing now is like neurosurgeon opening the skull in the case of human body. And you see, here is the brain. This is the symbol for a human brain. And you can see there is quite lots of electronics actually involved. These interfaces for the individual peripheral devices. There is also the important outlet from the docking station, which connects the docking station directly to the motherboard. When the notebook is docked, the connection with the processor is very direct all these peripheral devices are actually giving input and data to the bus of the motherboard, which is quite direct to the processor itself. What I am actually showing with this analogy is, the, is this very close relationship between brain and mind. When it is docked, so it is very intimately connected with the processor, with the experience, but when it is undocked, it has its own life and goes its own way. Now, the important message to the neurologist, neuroscientists, when they are using EEG, electroencephalograph, or MRI, uh, magnetic uh, resonance imaging, or CAT scan, eh? computed tomography, they are not measuring the activities of the mind. They are measuring the activities of the docking station of the brain only. I think this is very important message to the neurology and neuroscience. So let's put all back. And now let us see what will happen when I when I press the red button. It's a little joke, but as a first thing, I was trying to turn the camera of the notebook towards the docking station to symbolize that what many near-death experiences or dying experiences actually are reporting as the first thing that they are hovering over their body, witnessing frantic activities of the doctors over the dead body. 
Usually the, the near-death experience starts like that, but then the mind, hmm, the notebook, the, the mind, goes its own way, usually still having some kind of an etheric body or fine material body, which gradually dissolves anyway. Usually later on it is just the mind and consciousness witnessing some quite dynamic, dramatic events, positive or negative. And if we now look at the docking station, it's completely black. The docking station, the periphery, the brain is now dead. And the experience on the screen of consciousness continues. So this is the message I wanted to show. The relationship between brain and mind. When it is docked, very, very intimate, very direct, but it can undock and it can go its own way. And here is the summary in a graphic form. If you look to the left side, when the notebook is not connected, so the docking station is good for absolutely nothing. Even if the periphery is switched on, everything in perfect condition, you cannot do anything with that. So similarly, the human body and the brain even when the sensory organs are intact and in perfect condition, the body is alive, but the consciousness and the mind is not connected. It's absolutely good for nothing. <laughs> it's like vegetable in the garden. Very different with the notebook. When the notebook is connected in the docking station, when it is docked, so it is receiving the data from the peripheral devices. But when it is disconnected, when it is undocked, it is still functioning very well. It has its own battery and hard drive and antenna and display. But it is working in a different mode. So similarly, the mind, the consciousness and the mind, when it is docked or connected with the brain, with the body, so it is receiving the data, the information from the sensory organs and the brain. But when it is disconnected from the body, from the brain, it is still functioning very well, still very alive, but functioning in somehow different mode. We would say it is functioning in different frequency of reality, in the spiritual reality. You see, simple as that. And docking, undocking. As long you have it fresh in your mind. I wanted also to include here at least one authentic near-death experience report. In this particular case, I think it is actually dying experience because Dr. Antony Cicoria was hit by a lightning and he died there. Fortunately, he was resuscitated quite quickly. Um, I borrowed this video from Spiritual Master's Web, Supreme, Supreme Master's Web. Lots of information there I can recommend. But it was too long, so I cut it together, taking just the relevant parts, putting it together. Enjoy it. Where I was standing um, at the phone, the building got hit by lightning. And I remember hearing this loud crack, and I saw this big flash of light come out of the phone, and it hit me right in the face. And I remember seeing every bit of that, and when it hit me in the face, it just sent me flying backwards like a rag doll. And suddenly, as I was going backwards, suddenly something changed and I was moving forwards. And, and, and I remember standing there thinking, this is really strange. I know that I got hit. I know that something bad happened and I went flying backwards, but 
Now I'm not going backwards anymore. I'm, I'm just kind of standing here. And I remember looking down at my feet and, and I looked at the wall and the phone is dangling. And, and, I, and I still am mystified as to what had happened. But yet I had complete recall of every millisecond of, of that time. And right about that, that moment, I, my mother-in-law, who was at the top of the stairs, starts screaming. And she starts running right at me. And I, and I felt like a deer in the headlights. I, I'm looking at her going, oh, what's, what's going on? And she ran right by me. And I, and I turned to see where she was. And I, and I looked over on the ground. And I'm on the ground. And I, th and I thought, well, I mean, this is exactly what I thought. I said, but I'm dead. Um, and as I was standing there, I'm, I'm watching what's happening. And there was somebody waiting to use the phone. And it turns out it was a nurse in the middle of nowhere waiting to use the phone. Um, and so she drops down to the ground to start doing CPR. And, and my mother-in-law was standing there and, and all these other people were there by then. And I'm still standing here and I'm looking at them. I hear everything they're saying, but they can't hear me. And they can't see me because I'm calling out to them. And, and at that point, it was, it was interesting because the first realization that I made was, gee, there's not been a break in conscious thought at all. So whoever I am is not in the body. It's whatever, whatever form I'm in, spiritual form, is who I am. Because the consciousness is with me. All of my thoughts are with me. All of my memories are with me. And, and I thought, well, I guess there's no point in hanging around here. The second thing that was very interesting to me was that it was very dispassionate. There was no emotion associated with the fact that I was dead. It was very matter of fact, oh well, I am. And so I, I thought, oh, there's no point in staying here. So I, I turned and I start to walk up the stairs. And I don't know where I was going, but that just seemed to be what I was going to do. And as I'm looking down, at my legs, I see my legs dissolve, um, and so suddenly I'm I'm not in a in a solid form anymore. I I can see that I'm becoming an, a floating energy ball of some sort. I go up, I float up the stairs, and I pass through the wall into the room where the all the family is, and I saw my kids and and the rest of my family and my wife and. And they were all having fun and painting faces, and, and I thought, they'll be fine. And there was no emotion associated with the fact that I wasn't going to see them again. It was just very matter of fact, they'll be fine, and I'm going someplace else. And I floated out of the building, and when I got out of the building is when things really started to happen. As I got out of the building, all of a sudden, I was wrapped in this bluish-white light. At first, I was like, okay, what is this? And I'm analyzing it as it's happening. And it, if you could imagine absolute, pure love and peace, that's what it felt like being in this light. And that's what this was like, but this was absolute love and peace. And it was like falling into a river of pure positive energy. I knew that that where I was going felt pretty good because I could sense that I was being taken someplace. And I saw the really high points and low points in my life just kind of quickly go by. You know, it's my kids and, you know, I, I did this or I did that but I was really happy about it. And then right about the time that I was so happy that I was going, all of a sudden, bam, I was back in my body. I was angry. 
I, you know, I remember it hurt. I mean, you know, I went from absolute bliss to feeling, you know, like somebody had gotten punched in the mouth. And I had a burn on my face and I had a burn on my foot. And there's this poor woman who's doing CPR and I just wanted to tell her to stop. And, but I'm still unconscious. I'm in the, you know, I'm, I'm stuck back in this body. It's unconscious, but, you know, my consciousness is still very aware of what's going on. And it seemed like several minutes after, after that, that she stopped and I managed to be able to open my eyes and, and everything was very fuzzy. And, and I, I, I sat up and, and I just wanted to say that I was okay and I wanted to thank her. Yes. Um, what is me? I think me is spirit and the spirit lives on and that we have a memory of of all the times we've come into this earth plane and um, we we come we cycle through and and we keep going through this process until we learned a good enough grade that we don't have to keep coming here Wonderful story, wonderful report, and, and so many things contained in the report of Dr. Chikoria. And you also, you can see so clearly this ability of the mind to dock and to undock from the brain, from the body. But let's be clear that in the real life there are also many stages in between that some of the centers of the brain are connected with the mind directly, but another centers may be shut down or disconnected or even undocked. You know, so th there are many, many stages in between. One example of this partial disconnection between brain and the mind are the dreams in the night, usually starting with a review of the, of the events of the day, Sometimes even older material is presenting itself for a kind of a review. Material from the brain storage, I already mentioned, uh, symbolized in our analogy by the external hard drive. These are the memories and memories of events and experiences from this lifetime. All the conceptual thoughts and thinkings and kind of reflections and e even feelings in a basic form. When the brain gets damaged, so this kind of a memory may not be easily accessible anymore. Let's say by injury or, or Alzheimer. So this would be the first storage, brain storage. But then, usually, the sleep and the dream deepens, some of the rational controlling functions of the brain may be reduced or even suspended completely, so that the material, unresolved material from the second storage may get free access into the mind. In Buddhist teaching this is called karma. Um, karmic potentialities, unresolved material, uh, getting into the perception, perception is the story maker. So the perception will make the kind of a stories out of these potentialities, presenting it to the consciousness. And we get nice dreams, bad dreams, confused dreams, even nightmares. It may be helpful at this point to explain how karma is understood in Buddhism. The original meaning of the word karma is action or deed, but karma has in Buddhism much, much larger meaning. It is the central part of the teaching of conditionality and causality. It has a central position in the teachings of ethics. It is a decisive factor in the process of rebirth. But 
For the purpose of this presentation, I prefer to present karma in almost a scientific way. The easiest way to understand it, imagine it as a kind of debt. When we act against the nature of things, we create a particular potential of imbalance or disturbance. Karma is the thirsty line, the thirsty track remaining behind our imperfect living. The unfinished business, kind of positive or negative disbalance, disturbance of equilibrium. This debt goes with us in a latent form, waiting for the opportunity to return or discharge its potential back into life, to reinstall the equilibrium. We can understand karma and its result to be a kind of a basic law of nature, comparable a little bit to the second law of thermodynamics, when imbalances seek equilibrium. You can understand it even clearer when you look into the life of fully realized, fully enlightened beings. They live in harmony with the life, in harmony with their personality and with their nature. And even if they do big things, there isn't this kind of thirsty karma remaining behind their lives. Always being even with everything on the spot. They live with wisdom and compassion. They just respond to the events coming to them from outside or inside. But we, we react. That's the difference. Driven by forces of, of imperfection, we react with emotions, with liking and disliking, with desire, resistance or delusion. And that's karma. That creates karma. One of the chief producers of karma is the attachment to the idea of self. This ego obsession, me and mine, ego-centeredness, egoistic attitudes. When the particular karma finds the opportunity to discharge its potential back into life, that's called vipaka. It is the time when karma ripens and brings its result. And so we distinguish good karma and bad karma, or better, wholesome karma or unwholesome karma. Both is a kind of that. Both is a kind of disturbance of equilibrium. When karma of wholesome things ripens, we are in happiness. When unwholesome karma brings its result, we are in suffering. Actions are not good or bad because of some divine definition. Actions, but also thoughts, speech, also mental attitudes, motivations, all that. We distinguish wholesome or unwholesome actions because of the result they bring about. Is everything in our life result of karma? Very, very often comes this question. Certainly not. Karmic forces are only dispositions. Many things can happen to us in our life, but only that which will somehow resonate with elements from our karmic pool will really touch us, positively or negatively. Karma also steers the rebirth of beings. You know, this is Buddhism. And then we are born with unfinished karma from previous existences. We consume karma during our life, but by reacting and acting selfishly, we create new karmic forces, good or bad. Buddhism teaches to create good karma, but in the ultimate goal, it aims at ending karma altogether. So even the dreams are a kind of a karma work when some karmic stored stuff presents itself to the mind for integration, for healing. But, Father, in our computer analogy we have even a third gateway of entry in our experience, symbolized on the picture by the Wi-Fi antenna. 
it is a symbol for input coming to the mind from transcendental or spiritual zones, from all kinds of different frequencies of reality. You see, I, I put this on the paper because it would be too difficult to formulate it correctly in a concise way. And so here is the summary. We should understand the brain to be rather a shield or a defender or actually, actually a blocker of any spiritual otherworldly input. Everything which goes through the brain into the mind is worldly and mundane by definition. And under normal circumstances the worldly stuff has priority so that the other influences are blocked or strongly reduced. And of course when the body dies that's exactly is the rational filter has gone all this rational mm, limitation or or steerings have gone and now the mind is fully opened for the active karma and for the influences from from the spiritual re realities different zones now <coughs> some explanations the mainstream science heaviest argument for the brain creates mind theory which is actually an assumption is the evident fact and truth that with the help of chemical substances it is possible to influence even change the experience of the mind psychoactive drugs used in therapy and psychiatry can change the quality of life. Psychedelic chemical substances quite evidently can trigger enormous dramatic even spiritual experiences. Isn't it a rock-solid proof that the experience, even transcendental experience, is created by material brain? Uh, you know, rhetoric question. <laughs> now comes the rhetoric answer. It is not. <laughs> We can compare the function of psychoactive drugs with influencing the electronics of the docking station. If we go back to our computer analogy, in the docking station if we influence the electronic in any subtle way or any targeted way, influencing the, it will influence the stream of data coming to the notebook, certainly yes. And of course it is a very specific way we, we want to increase the colors or make it a little bit more quick or whatever. So similarly these psychoactive drugs are influencing the work of neurotransmitters and endorphins and dopamine and all that so that actually the brain works somehow more smoothly or as we, as we want to work. So in that case of course this these drugs work and influence the quality of life but in no way there are proof that the brain is producer of consciousness or the producer of the mind that's the message here now <coughs> there are some scientific experiments when electromagnetic impulses were sent to the lobe of a volunteers using the spiritual helmet or they call it the God Helmet. These people were then reporting almost spiritual experiences of oneness or even kind of a weak mystical experiences. The mainstream science took this as a proof and evidence that all spiritual experiences are created by brain and they are the product of the brain. The truth is actually exactly the opposite. Sending electric or electromagnetic waves to some brain centers will certainly disturb, jam or hamper the normal brain very subtle neuronal functions. It will set certain brain areas out of work so that some of the transcendental contents can address the mind. This is my explanation to this very notable and interesting experiment. 
I was I was um, tracing already quite some time ago, thinking about well, how is how this would be possible. Another example. Doctors gave a dose of psilocybin to a volunteer. Um, well, psilocybin is the mushroom substance, very strong hallucinogenic drug. And they then put that person into MRI scan, expecting spectacular firework in the brain neuronal activity. But actually the opposite was the result, especially the psychedelic drugs are rather blocking or dist disturbing or switching off some of the normal regular functions of the brain, these protective functions of the brain, so that the transcendental co contents may resonate, come in into the mind. It was done by Professor David Nutt and his, and his groups and what he said about this experiment in a video clip and what we found was completely surprising and exactly the opposite what we predicted because we found that psilocybin turned off blood flow in the key parts of the brain such as the prefrontal cortex, the posterior cortex and the thalamus. When you look at those parts of the brain you realize that they are actually the parts of the brain which control and integrate the way in which the brain processes information. They are the kind of gatekeeper regions, the nodes, which regulate what you do and what you feel. And by switching those off, we can kind of liberate the rest of the brain so that it can do other things. And that's why you get the expansion of consciousness. The mind is not created by brain. And these are all indications for that. But what I would consider as a real proof is one case from the collection of Ian Stevenson. It was not collected by him, it happened in Bangalore in India. And it was collected by Dr. Satwan Pariska, Associated Clinical Professor of National Institute of Mental Health in May 1985. Again, to make the story short, Sumitra was a barefoot married village woman and she died of a seizure. They declared her dead. But after some time she woke up as a completely different woman, as a Shiva, a daughter of a schoolmaster, of a, of a school teacher from another village, which died violently some years before. Now, suddenly she did not recognize uh, anybody from, from her previous family. She felt very strange to meet her husband, so to say. She started to address him in a very special way. Now, she was a quite an intelligent woman with a completely different personality. She could read and write. When the schoolmaster from the other village heard about that, he came to see her. She immediately recognized him. She could actually recognize even the mother. They made a kind of a test visiting the family of the school teacher. There were quite a number of women all over and they hide the mother into her special room. And Shiva wa was immediately clear that mother is not here. She would go to the room of the mother. She, she, she knew where it was. She could remember 16 accounts of Shiva's life not mentioned in any press reports. She identified 22 relatives of Shiva from photograph, some of them naming directly by name. So I think even that walking among us almost without a brain. It is called hydrocephalus. It is this, this article I came across. On the right side, this is the brain of a normal average person. On the left side, this is the hydrocephalus. When there is a huge cavity filled with cerebrospinal fluid. And a little bit of the brain tissue at the, the edges of the skull. 
And this is a person who has a job as a civil servant, uh, father of two children. Actually, they found it by chance that uh, he has this huge cavity in the head. And his IQ is under the average, that's true. 75, that's not very good. So the average would be 100 or 105, 110. And he has 75. But in a certain framework, he can lead a normal life. You know, and how to explain? So this is my recommendation also for the neuroscience. Um, to have its skeptics, but to also have uh, open windows for a completely new way of understanding, especially if it promises to explain so many new things, um, considering the complexity of the mind as well. Uh, I came across another article which was actually exploring the complexity of the body, of the human body. I could not believe it, so I started to calculate it myself. And in fact, I came to the double of that incredible message. So it was, this article was describing the human body consisting of 37 trillions of cells. The number uh, is, the assessment is now higher. I remember mm, some 20 years ago, it was something like 10 trillions. Now it is more, it is 37 trillions of cells. Each cell has a nucleus with chromosomes. Mm? Human cell has 23 chromosomes or chromosome double or chromosome pairs. And the chromosome, actually, it's a DNA molecule coiled very tightly together. Uh, the 23 chromosomes are not, not the same. They are different in size, but the average size of, of DNA, if you straighten up the molecule, so the average size is 5 centimeters. If you would straighten the DNA of one human cell and connect it together, 230 centimeters, two me over 2 meters, which is a lot, because it is just a molecule. This double helix DNA is a molecule 3 nanometers thin, which means 20,000 times thinner than the human hair. This article was just um, playing with the idea that we would take the DNA of one human body, straighten it up and connect it. How long will it be, this fiber? From London to Paris? What do you think? From London to New York? Or 20 times around the Earth? What do you think? All wrong, all wrong, terribly wrong. Million times around the Earth. One human body. Actually, according to my calculation, almost two million times around the equator. This enormous complexity of the, of the human body. And we are sometimes so stupid referring to it, my body. What is mine in that? The digestion or the blood circulation or the immune system? The neuronal network, what is mine in the body? Now imagine if the mind would be more complex than the body. Possible, I don't know. So neuroscience is doing big step forwards. In my understanding, it is a big end step forwards on a journey many miles long. Now, I think with this preparation we are now ready to proceed to the next chapter in this exploration talk. 
um, not yet near death experiences, but out of body experiences. Let's look at that phenomenon a little bit more preciser, because that's kind of a between link. And we can we can understand the near death experiences better when we understand out of body experiences. There are two kinds of them, but to start with that, I will take a kind of a reference base so that we have something solid, what we can rely on. And I will take the very detailed description of out-of-body experience of psychologist Dr. Susan Blackmore. When she was young in Cambridge, she was exploring different areas of, of paranormal phenomena as generally. But as a psychologist, keeping quite a sober view and mind over that, critical mind actually, perhaps even too, too critical, materialistically colored. Uh, they had some meeting and then they went to their private rooms and she described that they were using cannabis. You know, this is the academic cover name for marijuana. They were stoned on marijuana and in that state she got extremely strong out-of-body experience, starting with dissociating from the body, uh, seeing her from above, then continuing through the ceiling above the Cambridge building, then she would travel towards the Mediterranean, then back over, it, over Italy, uh, Switzerland, then to New York and South America. Then she would expand to the size of the universe. Then again, getting so small, she could not fit back into her body. She was traveling inside her body, could not <laughs> wake up in that. Fortunately, there have, there have been friends around that helped her. Finally, she got kind of a back to her normal senses. Now, in her report, two things are extremely valuable for our exploration of near-death experiences. When she was above the Cambridge building, she moved a little bit because you know in this out-of-body condition you can move to certain limits by your will by your wanting so she moved to the gutter of the building gutter is the rainwater channel on the roof looking at it in detail and she could see that there are old metallic gutters there and then she continued the, the, the astral traveling towards Mediterranean. So the next day she went out wanting to see if her vision from the out-of-body experience really is matching the human world reality. And looking at the gutters, there were new plastic ones. You see, the out-of-body experience completely mind-made. So that's the first very important message from that report. The second one, for her, it, w it felt so extremely real. Getting the second message from this side, even if the things feel so extremely real, substantial, like this world around me, doesn't mean that it is real. And I take it as a very valuable information, because it is coming from, from, from a professional. And if you reflect deeply, you start to doubt even our world around us, because it appears so extremely real to us. But perhaps I will come to it a little bit later. There is a difference. 
So, I said there are two different kinds of out-of-body experiences. These, which are purely kind of a hallucination of the mind, but there is the other one, the other kind of out-of-body experiences. It is which can be corroborated, veridical, they are called veridical. When, when you can verify that this out-of-body mind was witnessing something which was really taking place in another location. The collection of verified out-of-body experiences is actually quite large and still growing. But it's true that these things are happening mostly among the close family members or relatives, so that the veridical weight of these testimonies is not very high. Therefore, very special position are receiving those cases which are happening in the hospitals, because the testimony is coming from professional personnel. To name at least the most famous ones, I would say Pam Reynolds. In 1991 she developed a dangerous aneurysm very deep down in the brain, almost sitting on the brainstem, extremely difficult to get to it. Aneurysm, it's the ballooning of the blood vessel. If that bursts, that is fatal the patient would die. So actually Pam was in a kind of a critical condition and everybody giving up because to get to that aneurysm without damaging the brain was very very difficult task. Finally Dr. Robert Spetzler took the case in Phoenix in Arizona but he chose a very special condition for this very special case. It is called the deep hypothermic cardiac arrest, which, which means that for the main part of the surgery, Pam was put into death. This kind of operation is called or nicknamed standstill operation. The procedure took seven hours starting starting with general anesthesia. The body was pumped with phenobarbital, a medicament to slow down the, the, the brain metabolism, to get rid of the brain waves. Then started the external cooling of the body to have more time for the main surgery. Also the eyes were closed and taped shut to avoid the drying out of the of the eyes, special beeping modules inserted into the ears of the body to have the possibility to monitor the response of the brain and brainstem. It was completely flat. In this condition, the body of Pam was wheeled into the operations theater. Now, the second round of the preparation started. Dr. Spetzler started to unpack the bone saw to open the skull. And the cardiologist, the female cardiologist, started to connect the heart-lung machine to cool the blood, to cool the body even internally. And at this time, pump mind come out of the body, undocked from the brain, and typically observing these um, happenings in the operation theater from, from above, seeing her body. Actually her face was also covered with the drape. Only the crown of the head was exposed for the surgery. And this is the condition from which her out-of-body experience comes. Instrumented completely, all the vital functions of the body was monitored, closely observed, and she is bringing testimony how the bone saw looks like. That what Dr. Spetzler was holding in his hand, this very unexpected tool, bone saw, we, we would imagine something like that, not at all. 
it's a kind of a pneumatic drill actually with interchangeable blades and Pam is comparing the instrument to the handle of her electric toothbrush she is correctly describing also the case in which the interchangeable blades are disposed she is even correctly remembering the conversation going on between Dr. Spetzler and the cardi cardiologist because there is a problem the um, blood vessel in the groin are too small to connect the heart-lung machine so uh, the doctor is instructing to try the other side the out-of-body experience of Pam is happening in this very closely observed circumstances of the hospital of the operation theater. Later on the operation continues. The body temperature is brought down to 15 degrees centigrade. Of course the, the heart stops by itself. The blood is drained from the brain so that Dr. Spetzler can use his surgical microscope to perform the operation and at this time Pam goes seamlessly into her very elaborate near-death experience and coming back after warming of the body coming back to tell us the story there was a very good BBC documentary about this case uh, it is still available somewhere in the internet and in that documentary Pam is giving her commentary I was looking down at the body I knew was my body but I didn't care my vantage point was sort of sitting on doctor's shoulder I remember the instrument in his hand it looked like a handle of my electric toothbrush and Dr. Spetzler later in the interview he was reflecting the case I don't have an explanation for it I don't know how it's possible for it to happen considering the physiological state she's in at the same time I have seen so many things that I can't explain that I don't want to be so arrogant as to be able to say that there is no way can happen this is a wonderful comment of a high-level specialist to express this kind of a humbleness towards the mystery of life very beautiful so that was the Pam Reynolds case um, the other case is also very special Vicky Umipek Noratuk a woman born blind she got married but was involved in a very bad car crash in that dying condition brought to the emergency unit of a, of a hospital and classically hovering above the table seeing the body on the table the special feature of this particular case is that first time in her life she could see when she was dead observing this frantic activities of the doctors trying to do the resuscitation first she did not know it is her body but as you can move in this condition according to your will to, to some extent she moved to the hand hanging from the table she recognized her wedding ring therefore she understood it must be her body on the table but again she did not stay very long and continued into a very spiritual kind of a heavenly near-death experience which she in this BBC video commented like this it is still very emotional thing when I talk about this because there was a point in which I could bring forth any knowledge I wanted to have and it was like this place where all the knowledge was and then I was sent back and then I went back into my body and it was excruciatingly painful and very heavy and I remember feeling very sick 
just few words from Vicky and we can feel the genuineness, the authenticity of her deep spiritual experience. This is the reason why sometimes I put the near-death experience of such a intensity parallel or in juxtaposition with a real enlightenment of considerable intensity. They are different, it is not possible to compare it, but the effect on the life is similar. The life is changed. But now, coming to the final chapter of this long explorative talk, near-death experiences, what it is really. And I would say, I would like to stay sober throughout this exploration, not jumping too quickly on any bias or a spiritual belief, rather at first to collect all the information available and all the facts and trying to put it together so that hopefully at the end it starts to make a clear picture. Um, to start with, everybody is complaining about the fuzziness of the term itself, near-death experiences. I would recommend three different distinct categories dying experience, near-death experience, similar to near-death experience. And dying experience really reserving it only for the cases when there was an evident cardiac arrest, there was no heartbeat, there was no blood circulation, and the report very dickily, very fiably comes from the time when there was clinical death. So that would be the dying experience. Important information from neuroscience. Brain cannot function without fresh blood. 30 seconds after cardiac arrest, there aren't any measurable activities, neither in the brain nor in the brainstem. Real near-death experiences are extremely intensive, clear experiences. They are not happening in the dying brain. They even cannot happen in brain without fresh blood. They are happening in the undocked mind. One example for that, I would take the case of Stefan Jankovic, Stefan von Jankovic, in Switzerland, 1964, long time ago, a horrible car crash in high speed. He flew through the windshield with his head, everything broken, blood everywhere. When the doctor finally arrived, the heart already stopped, stopped beating. So the doctor was trying resuscitation, put some injection into his arm, not helping. So when he wanted to make the heart massage, he found out that the rib cage is broken, so he could not do that. He declared him dead. But also at that time arrived a second doctor. Perhaps he was living in the vicinity, perhaps he was one of the passengers. There was a row of cars already and bystanders everywhere. So he came rushing and talking shortly with the first doctor, he checked the Stefan, declared also clinically dead. So they, they were standing there discussing a little bit the case and then the second doctor came to the idea that he has the adrenaline injection in his emergency case, so why not to try? So uh, he administered an injection of adrenaline directly into the heart of the body. And the wonder happened that after a while the heart started to function, making pressure so rapid transportation to the intensive unit of the first hospital. Now, probably this story is not quite unusual. What is unusual 
on this particular story that Stefan was witnessing all that hovering three meters over the scene in this kind of uh, out-of-body condition sometimes it is called the fifth dimension sometimes people are reporting seeing everything from all sides at the same time but actually what Stefan was reporting that he could actually sense or feel thoughts of the bystanders as well not only what was spoken there that he, he, was, he was hearing that but even the thinking process of the bystanders and he noticed one religious lady was praying actually may all the sins of this of this dying person be forgiven may he come to heaven and Stefan was in, impressed by this wonderful act of compassion and also he noticed the mental attitude of another guy that he was rather critical and angry and sending negative thoughts towards that what, what he was witnessing so that's the special case that two doctors declared clinical death and the report actually of Stefan comes from that time it, it is not only very difficult out-of-body experience it's a dying experience some days later the second doctor came to visit Stefan in the hospital <laughs> Stefan greeted him with a frown what have you done to me <laughs> to call me back into this soaring body and actually Stefan wrote in his book that the dying was the best experience of his life so very specific case very special now getting into the serious reflections about near-death experiences and again I would like to take a kind of a solid foundation what we can rely on or take quite some reference from that and this time I would take the Tibetan book of death and dying Bardo Todo many things coming from that it's an old literature I read it some 35 years ago but I think the, the major points I will re remember correctly first of all Bardo means transition the state of transition so when the body dies there is a some time of a transition and the book is speaking about three stages within that Bardo of dying Bardo of Dharmata and Bardo of rebirth indicating that there is a kind of a development in that quite a long between stage so that would be the next message and if you read if you remember the Bardo Todo actually from the beautiful white light of death which the near-death experiencer are describing with undescribable beauty and nobility and sublimity wisdom unconditioned love all these superlatives but then the bardo actually bardo Tudor describes these stages it goes down in the dharmata the first encounter is with the beautiful deities but then the wrathful the fearful deities and only then comes the bardo of rebirth uh, the buddhist teachings are quite clear that the rebirth as in the same level like again as a human is extremely rare it's true that Bardo Todo declares there is a possibility to, to exit into next rebirth in any of these stages and I think from the white light even to exit to the Nirvana or some Tibetan teachings even take the white light to be Nirvana or Rikpa um, not really in Theravada uh, Nirvana is not light certainly not but certainly a very high spiritual state clearly so 
there is a development going down. S you know, message to all those near death experiencer who want to die as soon as possible again to experience this beauty. Uh, <laughs> be careful because near death experiences is just, it's just the beginning of the between state and who knows how it goes after. You know, take the case of Howard Storm with his stomach ruptured and he was dying of pain actually late night in the hospital, no, no surgeon. So getting out of his body, he was taken by beings into the long corridor, getting dark, getting darker and hell really experience hell. So <laughs> you know <laughs> the next message from Bardo Todo appearing repeatedly in the text it is just projection it is just projection of your karma so uh, don't take it lightly because it's it's serious evidently but it is just projection very important message because that's also my understanding that near death experiences are the projection of karma. Perhaps the last things which I would take from the Tibetans explaining that after the body dies there is a kind of an unconscious break. And they say average is two, three days when the mind wakes up into this new condition in the bardo state and everything is enhanced. The bliss is much stronger than anything on the earth. The horror is stronger than anything on the earth. The colors, the feelings, everything's more direct. So there is a gap and um, this would explain why majority of people, even with the cardiac arrest, doesn't remember anything. Because they were still in the gap. They came back before the mind would wake up into the in-between state. It's true that occasionally we are having also a report of an almost seamless exit from the body, un real undocking into the out-of-body experience. Dr. Chikoria is one case. Mickey Robinson, another case. He was actually involved in a plane crash dosed with kerosene burning in the hospital, dying of pain actually, of the burns. And he said, like if you take a glove of the hand, he was in the spiritual world. Actually, I would turn, turn it that the glove remained in the bed and the hand would go into the spiritual world. So occasionally there is almost no break, but I think majority there is a break. So these are the things from the Tibetan Book of Death. It's an old literature, 14th century. Um, it seems that even in this area there is a kind of a development. The old religions usually speaks about kind of a judgment. And even, even some of the Asian or Arabic near death experiences really have this kind of a atmosphere like to be sentenced by a tribunal or at least being handled quite bureaucratically. The Indian um, kind of a tradition speaks of a god Yama, the god of death, Yama, waiting the deeds, black stone for bad deed, white stone for good deeds on a scale which which will be more heavy that will be the destiny but if you take the western near this experience is the majority you know this extremely beautiful kind of at least the beginning of 
uh, this afterlife between state. So perhaps there is even some development in that. Actually, what is this jud judgment? These people would report as a life review. Again, it is a kind of a review of the events of the life. Very quickly, even Dr. Chikoria was, was reporting some. Uh, Stefan was reporting much more, about 2000, he, he, his assessment. 2000 rapidly flashing pictures of, of the life situations. I would understand it in the help of my analogy with the computer. This is the time when the docking station with the periphery is dying. Mm, the body with all the sensory organs and brain is dying. So all that what was stored in the brain in the analogy that was the external hard disk. All unresolved stuff is a karmic potential. The potential cannot just disappear tracelessly. That's against the physics. So it is the essence of the life, unresolved life situations and deeds that it is transferred as a kind of a essence into the storage of the notebook, which survives. Hmm? Now it is a pure karmic potential from the past life. Kind of a summary of the karma of the ending life. Um, speaking about the understanding of death and rebirth in Buddhism, uh, Buddhism has actually the idea of endless rebirth in different spheres of existence. So what is actually giving, what is giving the direction of the ne next rebirth. Karma. Karma activated in the time of dying. So this is the explanation in Buddhism. Now, talking about the different spheres of existence, or as I call it, the different frequencies of appearances, I have, I have this diagram using that very often. I think at least once I should give credit to the authors of that. Designed by Sunandalim, compiled by Venerable Achara Suvano Mahatera. So it's a typical list of the worlds or of the planes of existence, meaning that all these frequencies of existence are inhabited by beings. These are worlds actually of beings. We are here, we are quite low. Still there are four levels under the human ones, which is understood as the spheres of misery or great misery. And all that is actually above the human uh, levels of devas or angels. This is the sphere of fine materiality the gods, the Brahmas, and the high devas, and the immaterial sphere, the Arupaloka. Um, so this is the understanding in Buddhism. These are all spheres of rebirth. The rebirth actually can go to any of these spheres, whatever, according to the activated karma. And um, here, in this diagram, the spheres are actually painted one over the other. In my understanding, I would put quite some space in between for a quite good reason. I would compare these spheres of existence to the radio stations. You know, there are stations which you can tune in and quite a lot of space in between. Abkadasi ai minori di 18 anni, probabilità di vincita sul sito. Protagonista della nostra rubrica parliamo dell'AIL. What is the characteristic of the radio station? 
all those who are tuned to the same frequency are actually receiving the same kind of broadcasting. Hmm? The same, like all humans are interpreting the world in a similar way. This is the table, this is the tree, everybody agrees, this is a house, this is a lake, that's the sky, you know, this is red, this is brown. Uh, more or less everybody agrees with that. So that, that's because, because all are tuned to the same frequencies. So this would be like the radio station, shared by many. But there is evidently also in between state, which is the bardo. If you study the different kinds of near-death experiences, quite possibly the difficult hellish reports may reveal the nature of near-death experiences more clearly than the exalted ones. It will become clear that the form, the form of the near-death experiences is a mental fabrication, or better, mental karma fabrication, similar to our dreams. You can feel in these stories the typical dream language, the sudden changes of the place and scene. Without any logic, the emotional charge in these stories, or another element of the dream language, substituting one thing by other thing, etc. But here we are coming to the central paradox of the near-death experience phenomena. From the worldly perspective, near-death experience belong to the category of dreams or mental projections. But as to their content, intensity and significance, they can be the most important decisive and pivotal events in the existence of an individual. Perhaps when all this will become more clear, then psychology will start to develop kind of a scientific religion to prevent people to have hell experience when the body dies. One of the most simple and most beautiful images of the aim of all great spiritual systems is the picture of the path towards the center. The spiritual paths are connecting us and bringing us to the center of our own being. Some Buddhist systems call it emptiness, you can call it fullness, it's the same. Coming home. We live in the outskirts, in the periphery of our true beingness, in a kind of exile and separation for very long time. On the spiritual way, we are putting aside our attachments and mergings in the vortex of presence. The opening can happen in a click, but usually it is a long way, because we love our prison. So, I think with that, I have actually explained majority of the near-death experience, disagreeing partially with everybody. Certainly I disagree with the materialistic understanding, not understanding of reality. The psychological kind of approach has much more to say. As I started, you know, this similarity of the birth channel with birth of the baby, to compare it with the tunnel and coming to the white light. Oh no, no, this is just a coincidental kind of a similarity. Meeting the departed ones, there is absolutely no meaning in that. No, but the psychological explanation has at least this phenomena of projection. Psychology works a lot with projection. We are projecting our own material around us. That's very well known. And in the near-death experiences, really, this is something going on a lot. So, certainly, psychology has a little bit more to say. But I have a little bit, um, actually, disagreement even with the spiritual community, which takes, quite often, the life just as a kind of a dream, 
hallucination, a thought, the thoughts are not made of cells, molecules and atoms. Spiritual community um, jumping on that kind of explanation. Everything is just a thought form. Not really, not everything. There are material phenomena as well. Abhidhamma is very clear about it. Nama Rupa. Nama is everything conscious, the consciousness and the mental factors. But there are also Rupa phenomena which are not conscious. And these are the earth, water, fire, air. In Abhidhamma understood as nothing material, please be careful, these are only characteristics out of which the mind creates the appearance of this material world around us. Not that there would be anything substantial, hard, heavy uh, out there, that's our illusion, that's the world of appearances, according to this highest kind of insight, highest kind of uh, truth or reality, these are only qualities. It is like things are painted with different colors in our mind. Uh, I would compare it, uh, what we know, quite what is familiar to us, we know that all the colors of the world are just combination of three primary colors. We know that. Mm -hmm. If you look on the television with the magnifying glass, you will see just three primary colors. And everything what appears on the television is the admixture of three primary colors. So similarly, our mind works with this four elementary qualities painting the appearance of the material world around us. That's Abhidhamma. Do you think that in this the Buddhism and Abhidhamma went too far? Too far-fetched? Too fantastic to be true? Not at all. Science knows these things long time ago. I told you already in the beginning. Listen what said one of the greatest physicists of modern times, the central figure of quantum mechanics, Niels Bohr, almost a century ago. The common sense view of the world in terms of objects that really exist out there, independently of our observation, totally collapses in the face of the quantum factor, quantum mechanics. <laughs> and Niels Bohr again, if quantum mechanics hasn't profoundly shocked you, you haven't understood it yet. And I would say, if Buddhism hasn't profoundly shocked you, you haven't understood it yet. Einstein was never happy with quantum theory, though he agreed that all its conclusions and axioms were scientifically perfectly correct. But still, this is his kind of defiance quote. I like to think the moon is there even if I am not looking at it. According to Abhidhamma, the moon is not there when you don't watch it. But the moon is not there even if you and many others are watching. According to Abhidhamma, there are only rupas, empty phenomena happening. That's all. That's the ultimate reality of the moon. But, on the other side, Einstein agreed and admitted Reality is merely an illusion, although a very persistent one. <laughs> uh, good to know, he is here referring to our everyday sense of reality. But more important than Einstein's thoughts is here the quote from Eugene Wigner, Nobel Prize scientist of the 20th century. The very study of the external world let to the scientific conclusion that the content of consciousness is the ultimate universal reality. 
content of consciousness is the ultimate universal reality and that's science it sounds like a handshake between science and Buddhism indeed do you remember the quote in the beginning Kalu Rinpoche you live in illusion and the appearance of things there is reality you are that reality hmm? your consciousness is the reality but you don't know it you project it when you understand this you will see that you are nothing there is not a real you and being nothing you are everything everything you can conceive is just the content of your consciousness you are everything and that's all actually it is not all because there is one more step to accomplish to free oneself from all these appearances illusions and hallucinations And now we are coming to the end of this long, long talk. Do the pieces of the puzzle come together? Are they starting to give a clearer picture now? Can we perhaps even answer this strange, creepy question? Is the heaven and hell real? Well, what we can say with full certainty, considering this great number of near-death experiences, authentic reports, what we can say with absolute certainty, that heaven and hell happens. To whom? To everybody? For how long? How real, how intensive. <laughs> I leave it open. I leave it to you to connect the dots. According to your sources of information, your reflections, your beliefs. Actually, the Buddhism was never so much concerned about the degree of reality of all of these planes of existence it was it was always somewhere somewhere around the teaching but it was never really the central point the real point of the teaching of buddha's buddha's concern was always the connected feelings of happiness and sorrow of bliss and horror that these feelings and emotions are what they are. At this point, usually bringing an example of the bad ones, when we have a nightmare in the night, a really horror, horror dream, waking up still full of fear, oof, it was only a dream, you know, trying to shake it off. Only a dream, really? So why is your pyjama sweat through if it was only a dream? <laughs> you know, this is the scary part of it. That during dreaming this was your reality. So even if all this, all these spheres actually are just a pure hallucination, pure projections, pure appearances, spheres of dreams and appearances, the happiness and sorrow is what it is. And certainly, even according to Buddhist teaching, to be reborn in some of these high divine places is a really very beautiful, noble and blissful state of existence. But the real aim of Buddha's teaching is nowhere here. Because Buddha was actually directing the people who follow to full awakening from all kinds of appearances and dreams and delusions and illusions 
to mature the existence to the level of Nibbanic peace, Nirvana, eh? the blissful, very, very sublime state of peace and freedom, liberation, so that we don't need to come again. I like this picture. It is a little bit like a symbolic portrait of samsara. Hmm? The ever-turning, self-sustaining, perpetuum mobile of all living and dying beings in the whole omniverse. Is it beautiful? Is it horrifying? Unfortunately, it is both. <laughs>